时，下面是语音中的讨论环节，让我们掌声有请讨论嘉宾上台。他们是 ，Now let's welcome、uh, our guests for the next session. Uh, they are Xu Ziwang, co-founder of Xiwai International School, Shanghai Xiwai Public School, and co-founder of Jay Kimmerman, British International Academic School. Uh, British International Academic School, and co-founder of Dominic Dichi, the Hanshan Academic School, and co-founder of Dominic Dichi, the Hanshan Academic School, and co-founder of Dominic Dichi, the Hanshan Academic School, and co-founder of Dominic Dichi, the Hanshan Academic School, and co-founder of Dominic Dichi, the Hanshan Academic School, and co-founder of Dominic Dichi, the Hanshan Academic School, and co-founder of Dominic Dichi, the Hanshan Academic School, and co-founder of Dominic Dichi, the Hanshan Academic School, and co-founder of Dominic Dichi, the Hanshan Academic School, Good morning. My name is Betsy Corcoran, and I'm co-founder and CEO of EdSurge. We write about education, technology, and the intersection of those two things. We also hold conferences. We had a major conference recently with 650 leading school leaders from around the United States. And so we are extremely interested in thinking about the combination of education and technology. I'm very happy to be moderating this panel today on innovation in the K-12 school district. We heard yesterday about artificial intelligence, but today we're hearing about where do students find technology, where are they interacting with it, what are the kinds of schools we're trying to build in the future. Our students face a future that is filled with change and with deep, deep challenges globally and in what they'll do. So how do we build schools that will help them uh, create a life? This is a perfect and very practical panel. We have people here who have been running schools that are hundreds of years old, as well as schools that are only a few years old. And much as Max was just describing, how are you going to build a system for the future? All four of these schools represent different ways of thinking about creating these schools and our education in the future. So I'm going to start with our youngest school. Alex, raise your hand. <laughs> Dominic, <laughs> Dominic, thank you, is uh, the executive uh, director, the headmaster of the Khan Lab School. Now everyone knows about Khan Academy, which is a collection of uh, hundreds and hundreds of free courses that are available to anyone. But three years ago, Khan started a school. It's a private school, it's a small school, Right now, there are about 140 students in this school from grades K through nine, almost high school. And uh, Dominic, uh, who has a very long history in leading schools in the United States and in Switzerland, throughout Europe, um, is leading this effort. So, uh, Dominic, let's start by talking a little bit about some of the core ideas behind the Khan School. You've talked about achieving mastery through content, achieving independence through practice, and growing students' cognitive skills. Explain a little bit more about what those are and how you're doing this in a way that's very, very different uh, from other schools. So. We have like uh, three pillars of our school. The first pillar um, is content to mastery. So all the content um, is personalized. Uh, the students are uh, working on digital learning tools. It's self-paced as well. It's also interest-based. It's kind of like the, the first pillar. The second pillar is uh, in the independence through practices. Independence is a, is a big element of our school. So we want to provide our students goal time, or we call it in the high school that we just open ownership time. Um, about 25% up to 60% of the time they're working on their own uh, using digital learning tools. Um, independence, uh, they're also sitting down then with like um, a coach, like a learning coach, we call them a lead advisor, and they're checking uh, on their goals. So the students are setting their own goals. And um, the great thing here is like, it's a 30 minute conversation, it's like, what kind of goals have you achieved and how did you achieve it? And also doing a deeper reflection on, on these goals. 
Um, independence is also we're disconnecting the grade levels from the academics, so we don't have grade levels anymore. Um, this is great because independence levels are based on uh, criteria such as communication, time management, uh, motivation, focus, and the student has to advocate for himself or herself to um, move up to the next level, which is pretty great. Uh, it's not automatically that they can move up to the, to the next grade. So that means a level two student can then be automatically um, um, uh, in, in a higher math level, for example, he might be have issues still with like time management or focus or motivation, but he might be super brilliant in math, so he can really accelerate in math, so we're not holding him back uh, in the particular grade level. And that's a part of independence as well. The last pillar is, is actually um, qualities uh, to experiences. We heard uh, over the last uh, two days a lot uh, what the future skills are going to be. Um, uh, Michael Moe talked about the, the seven C's, World Economic Forum talks about people management, negotiation skills, cognitive flexibility, etc. And this has a, a huge value at, at the Conlab schools and we're focusing on, on these skills uh, very uh, intensively. So our students are working 20% of the time uh, on project-based learning every day. So they're applying their knowledge um, in different contexts, in unfamiliar contexts, but also conceptualizing the learning, so connecting the dots um, um, in our schools. So again, we have three pieces. The content is personalized. We have also no grades. Uh, there's, uh, we have a mastery-based system, and the highest level of mastery is teaching. The second is we give ownership time, goal time, where the students are planning their schedule there on their own. And then the last part is the project-based learning, uh, the qualities uh, to practices where we're really honing these skills uh, what are needed because we're in a Google building in Silicon Valley. We see every day we see the self-driving cars uh, driving by, and when I see the kids uh, in in my play yard and, and, the, and the car drives by, I say, "Wow, I have a big responsibility for my kids." You know, Uber has been building a couple of years, so well, what's next, right? So, um, and that's pretty much uh, in a nutshell our school. Now we're going to go to a completely opposite contrast. Chauve Rosemary Hall is one of the oldest private schools in America. It was started in 1890. It's had famous graduates, uh, including uh, John F. Kennedy and even Ivanka Trump. Uh, and uh, Alex Curtis uh, is the headmaster, has been headmaster of Chauve for seven years. The students who graduate from Chauve go to the best universities on the planet. And yet, you want to change. How do you talk about change in an institution where most of the parents are sending them there because of what you have been? Well, I, I think to some extent we're not quite as different. It's interesting to take to, we're on our opposite sides of the country, but um, I think the spirit of innovation, um, a new school, a smaller school often has a chance to maybe be a little, um, a little quicker to change. But what's really clear to us is that we are 850 students. We've got students from 40 countries around the world, uh, 40 states in the US. Um, we're a large enough institution, and we're well established with a long history, um, that families will know they're sending their students to, to a school that is uh, going to have a very robust curriculum, wide range of, of courses, a rigorous educational experience. That's great. There are actually a large number of schools offering that. And so we're very clear, to your point, um, that we're evolving and we're changing, and we're changing uh, as fast as we can as the world around us changes. The, the great thing for us is that we've got a foundation, a tradition of excellence that we can build on. Um, but it's clear that there is not just, to me at least, that there is not just one style of teaching. And so what may have made our school successful in 1890, uh, 1920s, uh, changed again in the 1950s and 1960s into the 20th century, um, there are elements of that that are extremely important. And there is a place, in fact, I think still for a lecture or for what moved from a lecture to a class discussion uh, to collaborative work, to project-based learning, um, to uses of technology, whether that's robotics, whether that's coding, whether that's we have a one-to-one -one iPad program. I think the joy for us is looking for the strengths in each of these areas and being willing to try them out. And we have a, a school community, we have parents, we have students, and most importantly, faculty that are willing to take a risk. 
and work it out as we go along. I think if you want to have all the answers before you start, we're not the school. I know there are a number of well-established older schools that want to know exactly where it's going to end up. Um, as a leader and for my faculty, um, sometimes something not working out, trying those algorithms out, learning from the past, um, analyzing the data that you get, those experiences you can learn as much to grow as the things that you've worked out all the way and are absolutely perfect. So we know that if we're going to continue to provide our students with a broad-based, rigorous, spectacular educational, um, educational experience, we've got to grow and change and embrace the opportunities of the future just as much as my amazing colleagues to my side. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Mr. Ziyuan Zhu, uh, who is a founding partner of CXC Capital and for almost 10 years was with Goldman Sachs, but his involvement with education is very, very deep. He was co-founder of CUA International School, which is a bilingual K through 12 school started in 2005 uh, in Shanghai. And it was one of the first private schools in China. Uh, it serves 5,000 students, and uh, it is um, also a private school. It is not quite as expensive as uh, some private schools, um, but it's uh, still a private school. Susie, so, tell us about the core values of Ziwa. You wanted to create a school that really reflected content and values of both Western and Chinese cultures. and. Um, Tell us a little bit about that and how is it changing? Thank you, Betsy. Uh, well, this one will be all you and Thank you, Keep it up. Just make me um, Good morning. Um, our school was founded um, on the conviction that we can um, combine the best practice, both in China, i.e. The, the, one of the most solid foundation education in the world, and, 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 and that of, uh, uh, in the Western country, most notably the, uh, the critical uh, and creative thinking and communication, uh, research skills, to uh, bring up students to be a global citizen with a strong sense of root. Um, they can survive and perform in later in their, in, in their life in the real world, uh, anywhere in the world, um, be it Tokyo, Shanghai, London, New York, uh, Mumbai, and, and without much of uh, identity confusion and crisis, which I've seen a lot when I was running Goldman Sachs business with, uh, with the excellent uh, um, recruits from top schools, but they, they're maybe, they're, they're um, linguistically maybe Chinese, but culturally not a Chinese. That's a long story. So that's all based on uh, our co-founders, myself and the headmaster, Dr. Lin Ming, uh, personal experiences. Um, but before I, I say that, let me just make a one point um, very um, uh, clearly. The so-called international school, at least in China, is a national school, not international school, because they are created by law to admit students with a foreign passport for basically an expat family. They're expensive because they pay by the company. And so they're teaching national curriculum so that the students can go back to their home country to continue our education when their parents move back. So I think those are national school, not international school. Our school uh, is international school, at least um, it's, it's a bilingual and cross-cultural between China and, and West. And I just said that this is based on uh, personal experience. Uh, our, the co-founders, myself and um, Headmaster, from day one, we grew up in China and through Cultural Revolution and, and got the re-education uh, by peasants 
during the uh, before uh, Deng Xiaoping reinstitute uh, the college exam and open up at the university. We we're among the first class went back to university and we we're among the first group went abroad to study. He went to Europe, I went to America. And we both work and live outside of China more than 20 years. And we, we've done what he became the dean of a, uh, of a department. I become a partner of Goldman Sachs. We didn't even give ourselves, not intentionally or unintentionally, a English name. And we survived well. So we believe, um, we believe this, uh, this, um, this uh, model. In this combination of yes. both Western and Eastern. Yes. Terrific. Uh, and uh, next, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jay Kimmelman who has a very, very, very large collection of schools. In fact, he is currently opening one school every single day. Think about that. He started his program in Kenya, in Africa, more than seven years ago, and is now responsible for educating a quarter of a million students. And his students, who start very young, pre-K, and go up through about eighth grade, are now graduating and starting to go to some of the best schools in Africa and also in other places around the world. What's more, he's doing this at a cost of less than $200 a year. So Jay, talk a little bit about what you tried to do in starting Bridge International Academies and how you're actually doing this. Thank you. So we, we started with the belief that every child should be able to access this really high quality education from you know, remote villages and urban settlements across Africa and Asia, um, but be able to do so in an accessible way, be able to afford to go to a school where they really were realizing their potential. And so we also recognized that the need for this was at scale, that there were 800 million children around the world who lived on less than $2 a day who deserved and would benefit from the same quality of education that you'd get at the most elite institutions. So we started from that premise, and we quickly recognized that the way to achieve this, this, if you will, democratization of education, was through a combination of the high talent of human capital that exists in every one of the communities that we serve around the world, and technology that could super enable the educators and uh, the children in those, in those schools. And so for us, our model is a combination of technology and human capital. We run uh, more than 500 schools uh, around the world. Um, as you said, we've educated a quarter of a million children, and we do so uh, on a daily basis, leveraging data to understand what we're doing. We collect a billion data points a year, uh, amongst them a quarter of a million test scores every week and a half. We use that data to treat education as a science, to understand what is working, what isn't working, to be able to intervene and design world-class quality lessons, to be able to uh, personalize yet standardize that education at a child classroom and a school level. Um, and to work with amazing educators who are born and from the very specific communities where the children are so they can act as role models as well. And so through that process, um, we've been able to scale this and are continuing to uh, towards our goal of 10 million children around the world. So you've heard four very different models. So now we're gonna ask some questions uh, to try to understand when are these schools the right school for your children? for your country, for what you're trying to achieve. I want to start with the idea that Dominic raised, which is no grades. He's the only one who said, we're doing away with grades. I'd love to hear from the other gentleman about whether you could imagine doing away with grades in your school and whether that's helpful or not helpful. Alex, do you want to start? Sure. Um... To grade, well, let me answer the question actually with both uses of the word grades. Um, one would be grades as in years. We, we, we're pretty close to that actually because we, we'll, we'll place students in whatever um, class that they are appropriate for. So if you come in in ninth grade but uh, your math is at a certain level, your, your English is at another level, your, your, your science, um, what that means is at the top of the 
we're, we're lucky because Yale University is around the corner from us. So we've had students that have gone beyond our offering, which is two years beyond AP. So we have students that will be coming in their freshman year, taking an AP, we'll find something for them to do at Yale. So yes, I think I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that idea. I'm fascinated by the idea of meeting students where they are. I think the moment, the classes that worry me in my school are the ones where we force someone to take something based on their age or where they are in the school. Th those things rarely work. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna expand the question to the, the question of grades themselves, which is that I actually think that's the thing I would most like to go away with. Um, because, because that really is about mastery rather than achieving some sort of mark on a piece of paper. Um, and we've joined with a larger group called the Mastery Transcript Consortium that is working towards the idea of students achieving mastery of a subject rather than achieving a grade in the subject. And that's the future. Uh, Z and J, I would love to hear from you about how easy or difficult it would be to do away with these different levels, these grades. And then Dominic, perhaps you could also share what are the easy parts, but what are the hard parts about giving up this idea that's been central to schools for a long, long time? Yeah, so we work in contexts where uh, there are sometimes challenges with um, incoming levels of, of students. We work in, in Liberia, in uh, West Africa, where uh, certainly there are, given the challenges of uh, civil war and the Ebola crisis, there are 16-year-olds who, you know, need to start at a, at a kindergarten level of education. But that doesn't mean that they should be in a kindergarten class, right? You know, there's also a social-emotional component to, you know, setting up a school, as well as different accelerated paths of learning, right? A 16-year-old will learn to read, given the correct sort of ecosystem and education at a much more accelerated pace than you know a four or a five year old. So you know we've created a system that allows us to also take students where they are, but to accelerate their learning rapidly so that they can get up the grade level. And what that means is that you know while we have a larger age span in our classrooms than you would see let's say in America, um, we are placing kids into roughly the appropriate grade level but creating a curriculum and an experience that accelerates their learning rapidly up to grade. Z? No, we cannot, um, especially in China. Uh, I just said in my first um, uh, statement, it, it, it is fancy to talk, talk about bilingual, uh, cross-cultural, global citizen uh, nurturing school. It's very hard to accomplish. And in terms of grades, the same thing, the Chinese parents I think to the extent that maybe the parents all over the world want the best of the most world. They want a character building and at the same time want the best scorecard. So I don't, I don't think we can get away with that. And, but we don't brutally uh, ranking students like by numbers and get everybody uh, 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 too stressed out. And what we can do is really just go, just keep going back to the laws and best practice of education to motivate the kids to learn better and, and among the students to help each other. That's all we can do. Dominic, what's challenging about doing away with grades? Is it hard to motivate kids? Uh, not at all. Um, the, the only challenging part for us is because we have a massive based system, so the, the, there are no grades, right? is now with the colleges. Uh, we're preparing now our high schoolers for, for, for the colleges, and uh, there's a great movement in, in the US, it's called the Mastery Transcript Consortium, which we are part of it as well, where we're designing a new transcript now with a portfolio transcript. And that's probably the biggest challenge we'll be facing right now, so how to kind of like um, collaborate with the college admissions officers um, um, to place our students. I think that's the biggest challenge. And is it challenging to convince parents that it's all right if their students don't have that transcript? I would say the parents are very supportive. Um, uh, sure, we're also very selective at the moment, but I think they're super supportive, they're super open-minded to that because they see how their kids are driving in that system, how motivated they are. Because when they got an A um, and, and a B, they, they just looked at the A and said, okay, I got an A and a B, right? Now they're getting like qualitative feedback, a written feedback back, so they have to read first the comment and then 
dialogue happens between the students. So it's a big difference. So there's a lot of reflection going on as well, and they see what it uses uh, in their kids. So they're, they're super behind that. They're more worried about the, the college transition, for, for sure. But now with this MTC support, they got uh, less worry about it. But we still have to do some homework there, yes. I mean, there's two reasons why a transcript is worthwhile. One is it's a shortcut, right? It's much quicker to see a grade and get an answer. And, and we feel there's much more nuance behind a grade, even a, even a grade than, than that. And then at the end of the day, it's, it, people aren't that interested in grades and transcripts. They're, they're interested in the end result. Of it. And that's why we joined Mastery Transcript is because if we can do what we want to do and have it not have a negative impact on our students next step, because we're, being, we're really being driven by an external force. And so if we can remove that external force, whether that's a cultural piece or for us, the university piece, then we can do what we want. I would like to add also, you ask us about like the positive things, right? So and just talking about the getting rid of uh, the grade levels. And we had a student, he went for six weeks, he was working for Continental. He's such a strong programmer, so he helped him to create a new AI code for, for the new tires. And you couldn't have done that in a traditional system because they, they have to do the maths, etc. And he's so advanced in all the different subjects, so we can ease up time for him. So we have way more flexibility. And I think that's where the school should go in the future as well. There's more modular, there's more like core learning space type of, especially with the older students. Now, many of you have talked about the role of technology in your schools. So first, one easy question. If you turned off the electricity, and you had no power, could you teach your students? Just yes or no. Jay? Most of our schools don't have electricity. So you have no electricity, but you do have tablets. Yeah, we design, uh, we design technology and hardware to work in challenging ecosystems where battery life has to last for a week, where everything has to be locally cached and data, work on 2G networks, etc. So we design the technology from the ground up to work in a low uh, technical infrastructure environment. Okay, so no power is okay, but if I took away your tablets, that would be a problem? We have very talented teachers, but the, the tablets enable a teacher to be connected to a whole wealth of information that would make them less effective. Okay, Dominic, if we turned off the power, what happens? It happens uh, once in a while as well, even in Silicon Valley, right? So, um, for sure, um, it's very challenging because we are using a lot of digital learning tools, but um, it's good also we put in now like silent reading, at a certain point that they have like off tech um, uh, ours as well. So it's okay. actually good it's happening. It is a once in a while, it's okay. Alex, have we turned off the power? Temporarily or permanent? I don't know. Permanently, I, for I, a week. <laughs> for a week, no problem. Um, no problem. <laughs> yeah, that would be fine. I mean, we've got to keep them warm because uh, the power's gone off. But, but, uh, but other than that, I mean, my favorite day is when, when we used to have uh, iffy email servers and email went down for a few days. It was fabulous. We got more done than any other days. But the real question is, can you do the kind of education you want to do without technology? No, I mean, that's why I, asked, I, mean, not, I was not being facetious when I said temporarily or permanently. Can I do the kind of teaching I want to do permanently? No. And I think two gentlemen before me said the same thing. Could I temporarily? Absolutely, because we don't have a single style of teaching that we are completely reliant on. So could I buy a day, a week, a few weeks? Yes, but not permanently. Okay, and Z? Um, I'll give you one month of black off time. Uh, yes, we can continue, um, but it will be impaired um, uh, because today the teacher is using PPT all the time. We also do use videos uh, to um, mobilize the, the student agency thing, share the student's work through videos. And more problem, we're, we're weekly border with, without shower for one month, it's going to be terrible. Okay, so everyone needs to shower at least once a month. Very good. Um, let's move on to talk, even though you're using a lot of technology in different degrees, uh, Jay, you mentioned social emotional learning. In the United States right now, we're spending a lot of time thinking about the social emotional implications. How are students coming into the classroom? Are they ready to learn? Are they um, struggling with different challenges? Uh, you have a system where the teachers have uh, content guides and they are literally reading from the content guides, but how do you achieve that support of social emotional practices uh, in your classroom? And then I would love for others to comment on what's similar or different in their models. 
Yeah, I think for, <clears throat> for us it starts with creating role models um, from the community. So every one of our uh, six or 7,000 teachers uh, at Bridge International Academies is from the community in which we work. They are, are born or raised in that community, and therefore they act as a role model for the students. Recognize, you know, the students being able to recognize that there are, there's an ability to become a professional, a well-respected individual in the community from that community, someone who started from the same challenges uh, socioeconomically as they did. It's also someone who understands where the children are coming from um, and where they need to go. We work in, in challenging areas from northern Nigeria, which is under uh, terrorist attack from Boko Haram, northern Kenya, Uganda, etc. And so, at, you know, for us, it's about creating an ecosystem where we are able to show and set high expectations, starting with our teaching staff and then ending up uh, with our children and the parents who support them. Is that similar or different from what you're seeing in your other schools? We're, we're putting a lot of emphasis on people physically being in the same environment. One of the reasons to go to a boarding school is that you're, you're, you're there on campus together. Um, but we had discovered that actually even when we had everyone from all over these different places together, they were spending a lot of time in front of a screen and that was partly our course because we adopted technology in such a big way, but of course students aren't just love. They were like, well, I'm not sure, we'd like them to be socializing as well, but they were doing a lot of social media, video games, um, talking to each other, sometimes at the same table through, you know, through their, their technology, whether it's through their phones. So we've actually, put in place, we've, we've realized that things that used to be taken for granted, that people would eat together, would socialize together, would, be, would, would, um, would play sports together, we actually have to be deliberate about that. That I would say has changed for us in the last five years. We just built a new student center, specifically to entice people out of their dorm rooms. And one of the last additions, and may, one of the most successful parts of it was, we've got a room that has all the different consoles, right? It's got, PS4, Xbox, we, Nintendo Switch, the whole thing. Because groups of students were playing video games together in different parts of the campus or in groups of twos or three. Now we've got 40 of them in a room together. Now they can play video games together. together. And that turns out to be an extremely social event. In fact, that's the loudest room in the space because people are together. So it's really interesting how deliberate you have to be about setting up physical social interaction and that social interaction is completely different from the Facebook, from the from the WeChat, from the from the Snapchat interactions. Uh, that they're that they're actually quite adept at. Dominic, what are you finding, and how much time are your students spending with screens? I think it's a, a very important piece in, in, in the Conlab school as well. Um, as I said, we have like twenty percent of the time is project based learning. And um, when they're finishing the project, we have an exhibition uh, every seven weeks. So inviting the entire community to this exhibition, there's a lot of preparation from the students. They're supporting each other because sometimes they are not working alone, they're working usually in groups. So that forces the community building. And then at those exhibitions, I can give you an example. In, in, in level five, that's our middle school, they had to present their Olympic villages. And um, they were then at the end of the presentation. And one presentation was then elected to be the best and had to sit in front of a panel. They were not prepared for any of those questions. Sal, I, and two other people were sitting on that panel and we asked questions to the students about sustainability, what they want to do with the food waste, e-waste, etc. and the students had to respond. So we're not only building community like creating these events together, um, and but also we're honoring those students, but it's also we're honing the skills, what they need to do. In that case, it was communication skills, right? Um, and in different modes in, from, in an unfamiliar context, right? And Z, you've brought people together, really both to bring the cultures together, as well as uh, to create that support structure. Um, yeah, we, cell phones not allowed in our school. No. No Do cell we, phones at all? No. Are you gonna ever change that? I don't know. But okay. we do use no um, uh, tablets for classroom teaching, all these things, but not personal. Okay. Because no when, when you have a, a cell phone, <laughs> people group together and, and, and division and everything else online virtually. You don't have to be in a common room or not in a common room. Um, but importantly, I, you know, as human, human beings get together as a small community, you have all similar, all sorts of things, emotional, social things. Uh, but we do believe um, uh, to create 
a defining, um, overriding cultural and emotional environment is very important. And uh, that starts from the headmasters, from teachers, as well as from parents. So we spend a lot of time to um, brainstorm and educate parents together. So we have an, an environment where kids really um, are healthy and productive in a school. So could any of you imagine a totally online school? A 100% online school. Do you see that as a useful kind of education? Dominic, you're shaking your head. Uh, not at all. No, not at it's, all. It's a supplementary. And, and this from, from the man who works for Saul Khan. So um, Saul Khan also always said it's complementary, right? And I think what we're seeing right now is like when the students are working online, the gamification of, of these online tools is big, right? There are gaps when, when they're learning, right? So we have a human layer, so we added actually, initially we had too much technology in place. They work more than 25% of the time on online digital learning tools. So we paddled back. Uh, and so we added a human layer back into the system because contextualizing, it needs a human layer in it. And also now it's the, the teacher who makes the mastery decision. It's not the technology anymore. The technology gives us the indication of where a student is, right? It's great for supplementary, it's also great for acceleration, but I think it's really important that the, the teacher is still providing the context and also checks the application on it, because the application on online tools is very difficult still. Jay, 100% online? No, I mean, we also start education with three-year-olds, right? So, I mean, I think for most of uh, the human species, we need to have a, a human connection and, you know, and a physical leader in, in the classroom for both the academic as well as the socio-emotional component, as well as the peer group that was talked about here. So I think technology is an enormously powerful enabling tool, um, but I think we're going to be in physical classrooms and should be for quite a while. Z, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you would say not all the way online if you're no. not letting cell phones in the school. Um, it's a powerful tool, and we're never going to uh, get away with that. But it's a tool. It's not the way. Alex, would you ever put Choate 100% online? No, we th I mean, we've thought about ways to do it and work with people. I mean, I think that, could I imagine a fully online school? Yeah, I think some people will, have, are attempting to and will. I think that we... We looked at whether that was possible for us. I think we do believe that there is something uniquely important about people being together and that, that it is the human interaction that we learn. We're, we're a school where students live uh, together and they learn together and, and there is as much learning happening outside of the classroom, continuing. Without that element, uh, we think there's something significantly different. Will, will it be a can someone produce a fine education? My guess is yes, but they're really spectacular. Over the last few years, as you have either continued to build your schools or started your school, um, what's the biggest mistake that you've made? We, um, we began, we, we introduced an iPad one-to-one -one program. So this sort of goes with one-to-one. -one. We, we chose iPads because we wanted something that was least disruptive in the classroom, um, easily turned on and off, portable, the whole thing, and, and a good, good price point for our families. And we, our mistake was not doing, well, the program has been extremely successful. Our, our problem was we just introduced it and thought that we had talented faculty, students who were ready for it, and it would take care of itself. And we put a lot of things in place, we increased our bandwidth, we did some training. Over five years, we have realized the amount of support uh, that was required mainly for our adults. Uh, for the teachers. For the teachers. Um, and in fact, this group of students now, we're five years in. These are students that were, you know, have been living through elementary and middle school with, um, with tablets of some sort. I introduced the program when I first gone to Cho, even though I wasn't sure our faculty were ready, because I thought that our students in five years would be absolutely ready. And so it really has taken five to six years to get our faculty, the majority of our faculty there. So um, my, if there was a mistake, it was not doing three, four, five times more with our faculty before we get there. So working more with the adults than the students. Jay, what, as you have expanded, what's, what's the biggest mistake that you've made? I mean, we make a lot of mistakes. Um, <clears throat> some of them are, are, are intentional. I think one of the things 
that we try to do in terms of trying to make mistakes is we've created something we call the Bridge Learning Laboratory, where we take this you know, very rich data set that we have, you know, a billion data points a year, and we're trying to test out different approaches to teaching, right? So we're trying to see what happens when we redesign a lesson like this, what happens when we try a different approach to teacher training, and look at the data. We're looking for which things fail so that we can not do those, and we can do more of the things that succeed. And so, you know, we have an attitude of trying new things and experimenting with the intentionality of knowing that if we're not failing in those, those ways, then we're not trying things uh, enough to actually succeed in the big picture. <laughs> That's a mic drop moment. Uh, Dominic, uh, I'm sure that you are intentionally failing too, but what's what's a big lesson you've learned over the yeah, few years? Yeah, it's a lot we have to fail to uh, to continue, right? But I think the the biggest thing what, what at our school is like the teacher role is changing dramatically, right? So it's 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 less being a lecturer, being more like a coach, an assessor, a lifelong learner. We totally un underestimated the training of of all these teachers, right? Now we have a good base and we're certifying our teachers to teach other teachers, so teachers are taking now over to do the conceptual base training and all these things. But I think that's totally will be under a massive uh, totally. Um, and then the second part is the scale, which is scale too quickly, because quality is always behind in scale, right? So, and that's something I will probably do different uh, next time, um, those two things. Yeah. Great. And Z? <laughs> we charge too little. You charge too little. Okay. Uh, the the, the so-called international school and I talked about it at the beginning charged at least twice, if not three times, of hours. But what we do actually debate about, as they, uh, everybody said, we made a lot of mistakes, but knock on the wood, no bigger um, uh, mistakes yet. Uh, but we do debate about K through 12, the 15 grades thing that you I'd love to uh, hear your, your um, 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 comments. Initially, we, we started with K through 12 because we got a piece of land, which is about 30 acres from rice field. We built it up, and we happened to have a great team for kindergarten. So it's just accidentally we started K through 15, uh, K through 12, 15 grades. Then later on, you know, it was difficult. The third year and the fourth year and the fifth year, we say, oh, we wish this is a smaller school and either it's kindergarten, elementary, or it's just high school, maybe just from grade A or grade nine, China high school from grade 10. But nowadays, we now are, 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 are reaping the, the benefits of 15 grades where we, in the summer innovation classes, we can have uh, physics and natural sciences teachers at the high grades to help elementary school students to do some lab things. If you are just elementary, you won't have that kind of resources. So, we don't know. So hang in there, Dominic. It'll get better is, I think, what you're hearing. Now, if we had had this conversation 10 years ago, only two of these schools would have been here, Choate and uh, Z School in Shanghai. And I would argue that they would be very similar, that you have done an amazing job of combining Western and Eastern cultures, but probably the core idea of the school would have been more similar to Choate than perhaps to say what Jay is doing with Bridge. So my last question for you is I'd like you each to think about 10 years from now, 10 years from now, and answer two questions. Number one, how big will your school be in 10 years? And how diverse do you think the collection of schools that we will see in the world will be? So how big will your school be? Will it scale? Maybe will you charge more? Um, but uh, how big will your school be and then what will the collection of schools in the world look like? Jay? We forecast about 10 million children um, over the next 10 years. 10 million children in, in your schools? In our schools. Which would be about how many schools? 4,000. 4,000 schools, so going from 500 to 4,000. 
Um, the second part of the question was, what will they look like? No, what was You've it? portrayed a different model of education than, say, Choate. And do you think that in 10 years, will we see more divergence or will we see convergence of types of schools? I think, to some extent, I hope we'll see convergence on, on the following ideal, which is, I, I hope to be living in a world 10 years from now where it doesn't matter what your parents do or how much money they make in terms of the quality of the education that you receive. And I think we are headed in that direction and I'm hopeful we'll get there. Okay. Alex, how about Cho? I think we will probably be the same size. I don't see a real reason to change that size, but I think the traditional schools, um, I'm worried about a lot of them that if they, that, that are still, have not evolved, have not worried about 10 years from now. We started worrying seven years ago about what, what it would be like in 10 or 20 years ago and started training our faculty, started changing our campus, started changing our admission process to be ready for that point. I think schools that are still teaching in one style, uh, that are still offering a model that worked 20 years ago, I think will have to change very rapidly and I'm not sure that they are as adept at change as newer schools. And I think if a number of those don't change rapidly, they will either not be here or will be a shell of what they were. I think, I think, I th I think there is still time for them, uh, but those that have to, they, they better wake up pretty soon. So 10 years from now, the kind of school that Choate has historically been probably won't be on this panel. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we are not, it's interesting because I would say we are a completely different school than 10 years ago and, and to our peer group. If we look at this group, we may look more like a traditional school, that, is, that may be true, but within our group of established schools, we, we have become quite different. Uh, and we're not unique in doing that. A number of schools have moved, have adjusted, have understood the flexibility they need to go to um, be ready for the future. But I think if you're not a school that's ready to answer the question of why you are better than an online school, or why you're better than a day school, or why you're better than staying at home, um, you, will, you will no longer have a value proposition and you won't survive. So um, we're well on the way to that change. We're not all the way there. We're well on the way, but there are a number of schools that haven't been done. Z? Um, I think we will grow, but not by me and my co-founder, but by our successor. But more importantly, I think... But do you think you'll grow, just to interrupt, will you grow a little bit? Will you double in size, triple in size? Um, I think we are ready to um, uh, have um, uh, sister brother schools um, across the city, maybe across the country. And, but more importantly, I think we're doing the right model and, and uh, a lot more people will copy our model. That's that what I mean by growth. And I, I tell you why, based on the data we see um, by talking to people and, 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 and parents or potential parents, there are a growing number of the family that, that do not want to see their kids um, going, abroad, going to pure international school, or even leave country earlier and coming back, or afraid of coming back, and have no interest to talk to parents a few years later. And, and while uh, ashamed in, in the United States or elsewhere, when people talking about China in the classroom or in the social setting, they don't, they don't know anything about China. So our model has got to uh, 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 really increase the appeal. So I think if we don't grow, other people will grow. Now, your second part of the question, I think we will converge. Uh, because, converge. Uh, well, but I think all the models will converge because the room left for us um, is smaller but deeper. Assuming the full uh, development of technology, in particular AI, and um, I think the education is going to go back to its core best practice and core values and bring just our hardware. And AI is going to surpass that. Very soon, just like airplane and car surpassed some of our hardware a long time ago. And, but we have emotion, we have mind and soul and, and consciousness and, and creativity. So that's the thing that we all need to focus on, that the future generation will uh, co-live together with the technology constructively and then happily and successfully Otherwise, I don't think we're, 
we were going to be successful in terms of education. And Dominic? We talk a lot about scale and um, nothing is concrete yet because we're still focusing on, on our flagship as we're codifying it, we're about 80-90% there. But our dream, our vision is, is having like a global network of labs, but also we discussed the scale in regards to say, do we actually need to scale the brick and mortar school system? We can just have a bunch of like lab schools around the world, which are the training facility, because we have a shortage of supplies for all these new uh, uh, inventive schools that are coming up. So the vision would be really having training centers worldwide where we can train the teachers in those labs and getting the ideas how to um, reform other schools. And in some ways, one of the things you've heard the panelists agree on is the need for more teacher training and more support for the educators, regardless of what kind of school system they're in. So I think the next 10 years will be extremely interesting. We may see convergence, we may see divergence of models, but I think we all share the hope that uh, all students will have the opportunity for a great education, no matter what their circumstances, and that this education will inspire them and help their creativity and be built on the social and emotional foundation that is the core of all of our human relationships. Please join me in thanking our panel.